uh, I'm going to talk about psychosocial care responses to terrorist attacks with examples from Europe, from Norway in 2011, in France in 2015, and in Belgium in 2016. But to um, ha have a link with the pandemic, I would like to cite the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, um, on the on November 11th, 2020. She said, uh, the, the coronavirus pandemic has highlighted the need for more coordination in the European Union, more resilient health systems and better preparation for future crises. We are changing the way we address cross-border health threats. So today we start building a European health union to protect citizens with high quality care in a crisis and equip the union and its member states to prevent and manage health emer emergencies that affect the whole of Europe. So there is a name of more coordination of crisis management and health preparedness. Today, uh, uh, I'll give examples with work uh, conducted uh, in collaboration with Michelle and other colleagues uh, that uh, actually countries in Europe, they respond quite differently to um, terrorist attacks. So uh, if you look at psychosocial care after terrorist attacks, uh, it is important to plan the psychosocial care uh, in advance to efficiently respond to and to recover from terrorist attacks. Due to the unpredictability, the chaotic circumstances, and the fact that there are potentially many traumatized individuals, it is uh, very difficult to organize high quality care. And it, it is also very difficult to conduct um, scientifically and ethically sound research. So to develop scientific evidence on the best practices or good practices. There are several international guidelines on post-disaster psychosocial care, but they are, as Michelle mentioned, largely, but not entirely, based on a consensus of expert opinions. Among the recommendations are to promote natural recovery and also um, conduct screening, screenings uh, to uh, um, implement the step, uh, sorry, uh, stepped care models. But if we are going to do screenings and to implement a stepped care, then we also need to identify and reach individuals at risk of developing post-traumatic health problems. So to define target populations for care. So what do we actually know about how different countries plan to meet psychosocial care needs after terrorist attacks? Quite little, in fact. So that's why we started this work. So the objectives and methods of, um, of this study, the, the objectives were to describe the plan content, the target populations and the providers of acute and long-term psychosocial care to civilians after terrorist attacks. And then also to discuss how the characteristics of the attacks and the health systems in the countries under study, how that impacted the psychosocial care responses. So what we did, it was to review national plans and guidelines and other grey literature from each of the countries that were valid when the attacks occurred, and also those that were outlined in, out, in response to the attacks uh, that we studied to meet the psychosocial needs of the civilians. I just Is it difficult to hear me? No. no, you're good. Okay, um, thank you. Lisa. I just I just had to check because the line was a bit uh, broken uh, recently, so I just wanted just to fine. check. Just fine, yeah. please. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm very gl glad to hear it. <laughs> so first, if we look at characteristics of the terrorist attacks, we we chose three terrorist attacks. One attack, or uh, there were all of them were multi-site attacks, but one uh, event from each country. The terrorist attacks that caused the most deaths in recent his history. In Norway, that was the 22nd of July 2011 uh, attacks occurring in Oslo, the capital, and on a small island called Utea in a rural area outside of Oslo. In France, that was the Paris attacks on the 13th of November 2015. And in Brussels, it was the 22nd of March attacks uh, uh, in 2016. So if you look at these attacks, in Norway, there were overall 77 deaths, 
what, one of the uh, um, things that were particular for Norway was that there were a large number of minors, of children and adolescents. Nearly half, 33 of them were actually minors, that, those who were killed, and many of the survivors were also adolescents. Uh, there were first a bombing in the government quarter in the city center where there were eight persons who were killed. And afterwards, uh, the same perpetrator went to this small island where there was a youth labor party camp where uh, he conducted a shooting spree, killing 69 um, uh, uh, individuals, mostly young persons. In France, um, there, there were 130 persons who were killed. One of them were, was a minor, um, and 493 were um, uh, injured. There was first a suicide, suicide bombings outside the football stadium uh, next to Paris. Afterwards, there were several uh, shootings and suicide bombings at different cafes and restaurants in the city center of Paris, and uh, a long-lasting hostage and shooting as the, with bombings in the Bataclan Theatre Concert Hall, uh, which caused 90 deaths. In Brussels, uh, there were um, uh, uh, two, um, uh, two suicide bombings, first at the airport, and next there was a suicide bombing at the metro in the city uh, centre. Um, there, there, um, um, one of, because one, there, there were no children who were killed in Belgium, but one of the uh, facts, since it was at an airport, many of those who were affected were of another uh, nationality which means that many of those who are affected would require follow-up in a different country. And that was also, there were quite a few also in, in France that were of different nationalities than French. So that's actually quite common in terrorist attacks that you have to plan also for follow-up in other countries than where it occurs. Uh, if you look at the health system, um, as, as Michel mentioned, that, that is also something that may impact the follow-up. If we look at these countries, uh, since these are European countries with the actually very well-developed health systems that are ranked among the best in the world, with largely publicly funded uh, nearly universal health coverage. So in a global perspective, these countries are quite similar with respect to the health system. Nevertheless, if you look in a European perspective, perspective there are quite a few differences. For instance, in, in, in the organization of care, uh, in Norway, the primary care, it's essential. It's, it's largely primary care based, where you have a full gatekeeping system. That means that the general practitioners, if you're going to have the fees for psych, um, help for in, within the psychiatric services, if that is to be covered, you have to have, be referred from your general practitioner. In France, there is a semi-gatekeeping system. This means that if you um, are referred by your general practitioner, you will pay a lower fee than if you are not referred, but you will still get something covered. That means that it's less important to go with your GP bef beforehand. In Belgium, there is no gatekeeping system, which means that the specialist might be the first person you contact without any contact with the GP. Nevertheless, they are changing so that they are making incentives uh, financial incentives to to get more referrals from the GPs, and and this is if you if you uh, you'll see uh, uh, next now that in Norway that the, also the outreach it was primary care uh, based. So you see that the health system in regular times it will also color the the outreach after the disasters. Uh, and also if you look at the responsibility for post disaster care in Norway, that's the local municipalities that are in charge of the psychosocial care outreach. In France, it's regional health agencies. That, that is a larger geographical units that cover more people. In Belgium, there's a split, split responsibility. And that's, uh, first you have the federal authorities, like uh, in a national scale. And then if they decide that you should have a long-term psychosocial follow-up, then it will be transferred to the local municipalities. And when there's a split responsibility, it's important also to remember that there's a point of weakness. And unfortunately, that seems to have been the case also after the terrorist attacks, that um, there may have been a failure of, uh, of long-term follow-up uh, in this case. So if you look globally at the 
Sarkozy uh, care after these attacks. Uh, before the attacks, all countries had national plans or guidelines. In France and Belgium, it was mostly planned, which is more like this and this should be done. In Norway, there are more like guidelines that they are recommendations to the um, local municipalities. So there's more um, autonomy also for the municipalities. In all countries, uh, reception centers were set up uh, to provide acute psychosocial care. And the picture you see, it's Sundvolm Hotel. It's the, it's, it's the reception center close to Ute Island in, in Norway. However, the psychosocial care responses, they differed in terms of organization and content, content. And that was particularly in the long term after the attacks. If we look at uh, the Norway attacks, as mentioned, there was a primary care based approach. Uh, immediately after the attacks, there were multidisciplinary crisis teams in the local municipalities who, who provided care, who, who contacted those who were uh, directly affected. These teams, it, it's the municipalities who decide who, who are part of these teams, but usually you have general practitioners or other medical doctors, you have school nurses, psychiatric nurses, sometimes psychologists, and also the police, social workers, and often also priests or other religious leaders. But after these attacks, if you remember, it was first the governmental quarter that was affected by the bomb, which means that you have lots of employees who were affected. These people, they, they, you know who, at the government quarter, you know who is at work and who is not. So they were easily um, identifiable. And the same on the Uta island, since it's an island, you can also easily identify those who are there during the attack. So the authorities decided that after, for, for the survivors of the UTR shooting, mm -hmm. who were actually coming from the entire um, country, which means some in very rural areas, and some lived in Oslo or other cities. So very different conditions for healthcare. They were to give, have a follow up from local municipalities uh, with a designated contact person that were by the uh, employees of the um, uh, governmental uh, quarter, <clears throat> they were to receive follow-up from the occupational health services. This was an intention to keep it as close as possible to the regular, uh, regular uh, situation. If we look at the Paris attacks, the, the follow-up was quite different. In, in, in France, uh, you have a national network of emergency psychosocial care units the Cellule d'Urgence Médico-Psychologique and the CAMPS. This was established, in fact, in the aftermath of another terrorist attack in, in Paris in 1995. And this, in contrast to Norway, this is primarily coast, co composed of specialized psychiatric personnel, as psychiatrists, and they're usually led by a psychiatrist, but also uh, psychologists and psychiatric nurses are also often part of these uh, CAMPS. And they are organized by the regional health agencies. So they provide acute psycholo uh, psychological support, su support and also early screenings in the first month, and the, like in the acute aftermath. And these screenings, they are part, they have screening schemes in their national plans and also pre uh, planned uh, information sheets so that, so that they can use that directly after the attacks. However, uh, after these, this first months of the, of the emergency psychosocial care units, there was no systematic screening. It was only that those who are part of the emergency units, they provide guidance on what type of care they recommend after this uh, acute phase. In Belgium, um, there are... Uh, uh, in beforehand, you have psychosocial intervention networks in the local municipalities. However, the acute psychosocial care is coordinated at the federal level, so at a higher level. So as mentioned, uh, there is a split responsibility. So the federal levels, they will decide if there should be a long-term follow-up, and then they will transfer the responsibility to the local municipalities. But when we looked at the documents from Belgium, we found little information on what was actually done and who actually provided the care. But what we did find, it was reports from auditions in the parliament 
that there were a lack, a great lack of care and a lack of proactivity, which also um, generated the organization of victims into uh, victim organizations to promote better care for them. Um, so if we look at this, um, uh, this approach, it's, it's you know, uh, if you're going to conduct screenings for, for the long term follow up, a key objective um, of, of the psycho uh, psychosocial care will then be to identify persons and risk and uh, to, to monitor if they develop the monitor and prevent that they develop PTSD or other long term health problems. So then we have two fundamental questions. How should we identify persons at risk of developing uh, health problems and how should we follow them up? Because proactive outreach and active monitoring, it will depend on the de definition of a target population. So we need to decide who should be included, included in potential screening assessments. So as mentioned, the target populations may have been easier to define and reach after the attacks in Norway since it happened in the governmental quarter and on an island. Nevertheless, if you look at other countries in Europe, for instance, in the UK and the Manchester Arena bombing and in the Netherlands with the Utrecht Trump shooting in 2019, after these events, there, there were psychosocial follow-up problems with screening assessments beyond the acute phase. So it seems that the, the long-term follow-up, it's, it's not determined by the characteristics of the attacks, but rather by, by the policies in each country. And it should also be mentioned that in the UK, they had actually screening programs for survivors from the Paris and the Brussels attacks. So if you were a citizen from the UK, you had like screening follow ups, but not if you were a French or um, Belgian citizen. So uh, what are the implications? Um, as we see, uh, despite the aim for in Europe to get more harmonized health preparedness, there is a great heat, uh, different, there are many differences of, between the psychosocial care responses. So we should, is there then a need for international recognized uh, standards for planning, monitoring and evaluation of psychosocial care? I, 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 would, uh, I would say so, but I think that is something that we could discuss. Um, and I think we could say that international guidelines, it should also include a model on how to effectively register affected individuals that we should consider as target population for psychosocial care and health monitoring. It would also be relevant to have a greater mapping uh, of existing structures for psychosocial care in different countries. That is also to facilitate follow up uh, between countries. We need better documentation about what is planned and what is actually provided uh, in, uh, after terrorist attacks. Uh, and since they are so uh, unforeseen events, we need a framework for monitoring, uh, evaluation and research. So this is uh, based on a study that we recently conducted and which is sum submitted. I just want to honor the, uh, all, the, uh, all the colleagues that have uh, contributed. And I, uh, I was also asked to say something about the first responders because we didn't include them in our study. Oh, sorry, is it two minutes left? Two minutes left? Yeah, thank you. That's perfect, that's perfect, thank you. So for the first responders, um, we didn't include them because um, uh, it's, uh, it was to narrow the scope and also the fact that they are often planned at the institutional level, so it would be comp complicated to do that in each country. But there's something that's particular for first responders. It's the possibility to prepare in advance, to, to, to do trainings. And also there are support measures that they can know of beforehand and also after such events. Among the challenges is that with the identity as a helper, uh, both themselves and the surroundings might expect them to cope in these circ circumstances to deal with it on their own. Um, and there is also the fact that for, for instance, police um, officers, if you have post-traumatic stress reactions, if you, if you deal with high stress, that may, might also impact your capacity to work and which might make it complica complicated to disclose your problems because you might fear to lose your uh, position or, or the, the, the role that you have. I'll just uh, rapidly say that because we have worked also with that in, in France. So the only thing I will highlight uh, with, with the time perspective here is that actually we found that a lack of training 
was associated with a greater risk of PTSD. So that just uh, underscores uh, the importance of ensuring proper training to first responders. There we are. Thank you very much for your attention. I would really be delighted to hear your thoughts about uh, how we should proceed forward with the guidelines, but also um, I think should we aim for more harmonized outreaches or, or, or is it okay that, that we do it so differently across countries? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz, for excellent, really excellent talk. Uh, very interesting point. Um, I think before we move on, since you mentioned the, you know, the guidelines, I wonder if Irena can take like a couple of minutes to present the first aid to help to the audience. Um, and, then, and then we are going to take some Q&A. Okay. Yeah. Please, Irena. Yeah, um, Michelle actually uh, have mentioned um, and um, as well, you have heard this NATO uh, group or expert group, uh, and we've met uh, in 2018 in Odessa, in Ukraine, in Ukraine, uh, with the expert in uh, PTSD prevention from different countries all over the world, uh, psychiatrists and clinical psychologists, neuroscientists, and. Uh, 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 in, as expert in military or children uh, uh, mental health and uh, what we did we, we've set, uh, set for three days all together in order to uh, share our experience and knowledge on what should and should not be done right after a terror attack and as a result of uh, of our work uh, uh, we've uh, published a book uh, which is a guideline, uh, risk management of terrorism induced stress. Uh, and uh, this was like uh, published in 2020, like uh, about one and a half year ago. And since then, what we did, we've uh, translated all these recommendations from, from the experts uh, into uh, an app. So this is a mobile application, both for iOS and Google, which you can easily download, or you can use this website. Uh, it is available as well as a web page, uh, and you can get uh, easy uh, to use uh, recommendations for uh, individuals like. Uh, pharmacological interventions, psychological interventions, sleep interventions, and as well, uh, societal interventions for task forces, for media, for social media, for policy, um, risk management, and so on. And this is the first stage. We've just, uh, uh, th there was a, a release was this week. Uh, and what we want you to do is to uh, play with it to, uh, and to send us your feedback. This really would be very important because we have here uh, uh, people from different countries and experts, um, as we've heard just in societal interventions and uh, in individual interventions. And this would be really important. Uh, you would find the contact form both in web page and uh, on the app. Um, and if you, I will send the link right now to the chat. And if you have any further questions, you can contact uh, me or or Eric or uh, Professor Zohar, and uh, we can we can uh, keep keep those questions. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Irina. So we have time for a general Q and A. Um, and since we immediately squint over from uh, Professor Duckers, uh, Michelle Duckers to Lisa, let's first look at some questions that we may have for Michelle. And if I may entertain the first one uh, that I was holding on to is um, actually uh, it's a, maybe a naive thought, but I'd just like to have your 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 um, your um, your comment on this. 
in, in psychotrauma research, we often refer to Leonor Thur, and she divided a type one trauma versus type two trauma exposures. And type one trauma was this really cut a beginning and an end, which was a traffic ex accident and assault or so. And the type two trauma was a, a protracted uh, exposure kind of type, like protracted uh, early life experiences or going to war. And I was wondering if, if um, disaster um, uh, disasters uh, could also be divided up in like an earthquake, which is also one thing, but like COVID is a protracted disaster. We've been in COVID now for almost two years. And is, is this applicable to any information that researchers uh, could drive into any guidance on, on the research that we're doing. Just your comments, please, on whether that would make any sense or has been done already or what your thoughts are on that. Thank you, Eric. I think that's an excellent question, but it's also a complex question. Um, well, uh, I, th I think in both cases, whether it's an earthquake or a volcano uh, um, uh, eruption or, or a flood, on the other hand, it could be like a, a pandemic or a, like a, the, the slow creeping crisis we have in the north of the Netherlands surrounding the gas mining, where people are confronted with continuous damage to their houses and a, a poor follow up by governments and repair. Um, well, I think in both cases, if you would categorize them, you can have examples of uh, where people are directly exposed with danger, with uh, loss of everything that matters, threat. Uh, physical injury, um, and but at the same time, uh, since these are collective events, there will also be people who have less obvious consequences and uh, are more like uh, distant witnesses or uh, know people who have uh, experienced something. And I think in both cases, roughly, there is a hierarchy of the affected and the extent to which they are exposed. But then linking it to the typology you uh, mentioned. Um, I, I find it difficult to clearly divide people into two groups. Um, especially if you mentioned going to war, you, 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 you um, referred that to as the, the second category. But that's, that is something different than being exposed to an actual fighting situation with uh, where you lose close colleagues and, and being under uh, unfriendly fire. Well, the question that I may, if I may nuance it just briefly, you beautifully highlight the different phases after a disaster. But the, the knowledge that was gathered from these phases was because of a type one disaster, if I may call it that way, where you have the different phases. Like we're not there yet with COVID that we can see the same because we have wave after wave after wave. This is a protracted disaster. And maybe we need to look at protracted disasters where we're currently in, in a different way than disasters that are defined in time. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I understand what you say, Eric. And um, well, I think uh, actually th this uh, this model with the phases from honeymoon to disillusionment and a recovery that originates from classical disaster psychology. Huh? Beverly Raphael, 1986, produced the first version of it. And uh, I often thought, is this applicable to COVID-19? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, for a long time, I thought it isn't, but eventually, uh, if I look back and I look at the Netherlands, I look at things in Italy, um, there was a period for weeks in the beginning where you could see that people were very respectful towards healthcare providers and governments and uh, gave a, a token of appreciations on the street. Huh? So, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, support for each other, good initiatives. And I think that, that matches the idea of, uh, of a honeymoon phase, you could say, although it's a different type of event. And but later on, what I found interesting, there were uh, international trust barometers in different countries. And you could say that right after the summer, there was uh, a lot of growing distrust and satisfaction over governmental policies because people felt the pain of lockdowns and uh, all these social distancing measures, measures that took for ages and still the growing uncertainty, what would happen if the real respiratory season would start? because then we all knew it would be worse than it was. And in, in that phase, I had the feeling that it actually met, matched the idea of a disillusionment phase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the funny thing is, yesterday a, a journalist from a, a, uh, a newspaper asked me, in, in what phase are we now? 
and 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 and, I, and that really felt like Groundhog Day. You know, the moment where they get the the the, the groundhog out of its cage and ask, "How long is winter going to take?" Right. Oh. Well, well I, I won't take it away from the general audience, but one additional thought, and of course, this is very complex matter. And, and you know, when, when there's, there's often an old base, we have a protracted disaster, but then another disaster strikes on top of an already existing one where you have floods. And, and that makes this research area incredibly complicated, but also very interesting to look at. But let me, let me, let me allow others to, uh, to comment. And maybe Lisa wants to comment on this topic first uh, as, as a presenter. Do you want to comment on this too, Lisa? Well, um, I think uh, because if, if you compare with the, uh, the, the synetics of a terrorist attack and the pandemic, as yes, Salah did, it, it's uh, the things when you when you went through, when you uh, reviewed the, the plans and, and the documents, uh, actually pandemics and they were also mentioned often in the same uh, at the same time. So so. Um, uh, uh, with the, um, I, I think um, that, that it's it's uh, uh, with these long term events, even though it's it's very different. I think we will have the, uh, the shared fact that uh, what's planned in advance and the health systems that are there in place uh, beforehand, it will really shape the responses. Um, and and I think the pandemic, what's been really particular with this, like every country has been struck to dif different uh, extents, but then it really highlights also the national, the, the differences between uh, the countries. And also that we actually, you know, when we, when we, plan, when we, we uh, create guidelines, I think there's also a gap that we, we uh, sometimes we don't know what's actually being done in each country. Mm. And if you're going to create also applicable guidelines, or perhaps you should concentrate on core components or core elements of what should be provided. I think we also need to know better what's already in place in the different countries mm. to, to, yeah. to make it more um, applicable. Uh, because it would, it was really, uh, I, I was really um, amazed by the fact is that it was so different how it was uh, approached in countries that are actually quite similar in, in a global perspective. So if you think about the globally, I, I think um, it's, uh, we, we've got a lot of work to, to be done. But also, um, I think, you know, uh, to what extent should we aim for similar approaches? Because of course, it's not necessarily so that uh, the same approach would work as well in, in every country. Uh, so, so I think um, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's important to discuss uh, how, how similar should they, uh, what should, uh, what is absolutely necessary to have in each case and, and what should be more uh, for each country to, to adapt. Yeah, no, thank you for that thoughtful, thoughtful note. Yeah. Uh, Joseph. Uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, we are all looking at the pandemic and the, uh, we are looking at terror attack, but basically, you know, we should try all the time to look at the future. And the future is about the climate changes and the disasters related to the climate changes. And I wonder if we should not, to some extent, focus the guideline on this regard, because we know that it's approaching. I mean, we saw it in the summer in Germany, but it, it's going to a minute and in the last time, last winter in, in the uh, USA. So I wonder if as a group, we shouldn't now start and prepare <coughs> something for this. And if we are about to do so, what are the projection and uh, are we can, uh, what, are, uh, what we can put there because we don't know. And I would like to pick your brain in this regard, both Michael and please. Uh, th thank you, Joseph. Um, well, I, I really value the discussion we have here. Um, I, I was also thinking, uh, linked to one point Lisa mentioned, uh, what I really think is a red threat problem 
in all the events we run into is that we are very poor at making a, a good registry of the people affected. And if we don't have a good list or a good overview of different type of affected people, it's impossible to approach them for health monitoring or for aftercare. And um, we, we noticed this in the, the different cases Lisa described in her presentation, but we also ran into it in um, the, the, the terrorist attack in Utrecht in March uh, 2019. It's so difficult to reach people to follow up if you don't know who they are. And the typical reaction you get from um, local governments, national governments, is you try to propose a solution, is that, well, legislation does not allow us to combine the data on people. But this is actually not true, because uh, there are a lot of things we can do legally if we think them through carefully. So that, that is also, our, our, I think, internationally, it, we would benefit tremendously if we could develop a shared format for registering people, sharing information between institutions, and well, and use it as a starting point for a multidisciplinary good service package. Uh, just one uh, example raised in my mind. Uh, recently, I've heard that in Germany, uh, in terms of COVID pandemic, when you go to the restaurant, you have to uh, check in and register yourself uh, uh, within this table, within the chair. So, so somebody will definitely know with whom you have a dinner or a breakfast. And um, I thought, isn't it for a follow-up? Isn't it for this... Uh, uh, identification and prevention and um, what actually we have in terms of uh, terrorist attack what kind of uh, follow-up systems in, in, in for example uh, in Norway at least you have you have mentioned is there something actually exist and a second question was like uh, what kind of uh, uh, screening tools you uh, use in, in, in this uh, golden hours and the first months in order to uh, identify who are at risk. Thank Great you. Great question. I saw and we have her with us, Ulrike Schmidt from Bonn, from Germany. So she may immediately comment on the, on the question or the, 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 the issue that you bring, brought to our attention. Ulrike, may I give you my yes. ask you to? Yeah. Um, Thank you, Eric. And uh, hi all, I was a bit late, I'm sorry. But I'm happy to join. Yeah, what Irina just mentioned is right. Just, just introduce yourself, uh, Ulrike. Yeah, please. I'm I'm Ulrike Schmidt, and I'm working since long in psychotraumatology. I started at the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in Munich, and from this time I know Eric, and um, for um, with whom I collaborated a lot. And then I went to Göttingen, where I am now at the moment, and currently I'm working both at two university at the University of Bonn, which is my primary job as a vice <coughs> chair, and in the University of Göttingen. And I'm working clinically and, and biochemically on PTSD. Yes, now and I worked and... <laughs> a lot with the, um, with the flood victims in Bonn. This is what, what uh, has been just, just mentioned. And Irina just mentioned that um, COVID um, or people that are going to a restaurant in our country in Germany, yes, indeed, they are followed up. And uh, we are wondering um, since a long time or a few months whether we could use this technology for terrorist attacks. And I think this was exactly um, what your question was aiming at. And I think that the Bundesregierung, so the, the, the I don't know the word, uh, government, sorry, the, the government of Germany is uh, already thinking about the possibility to, to use it for natural catastrophic events, like for instance, the, the flood catastrophe, because there was a um, big problem with uh, information. The, the mobile network was completely broken down in the whole area. And um, yeah, we, we have to think um, of communication platforms for crisis situation. And maybe the, the COVID follow-up technology, I don't know how to call it, is at least in part a model mm -hmm. 
but um, for the flood catastrophe, it might not have helped completely because of the breakdown of the mobile network. Yeah. But at least some people usually get information and maybe they can spread it. I don't know. I think this is a very important point for, for all crises in the future. Yeah. Yep. So one of the preparations, as as uh, Josie, you may comment on it, reest, reest, restore mobile communication as as a primary reason to connect people and to bring 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 the ability to communicate. Yeah, Joseph, do you wanted to comment on that? Uh, uh, there, there is a question from Sofia. Yeah, Sofia, you would like to. Um, yes, with pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for the lectures. I have a question probably concerning to Michael. Um, if I understood co correctly, you propose to investigate the effectiveness of uh, existing trauma interventions separately for coronavirus, yes? So, I mean, like, if so, uh, can these researches uh, be extended to other types of trauma? Because uh, as far as I'm, I mean, like, as far as I feel, like, uh, coronavirus situation differs a lot from other types of trauma. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Sophia. That's an excellent question. I was already trying to write a short answer to your question, which, but it's difficult. And but perhaps I think what I actually want to uh, encourage or propose is that we take the context of the interventions we apply more into account. And I think the context of, uh, consists of three parts. And the first one is what I would call the, the disaster vulnerability context. And that is actually mental health conditions problems in relation to a complex set of risk and protective factors. So the first context is there is a context that is linked to the mental health problem we are interested in. That's the first one. The second one, we are trying to apply interventions to intervene in that first context. And these interventions, they are applied in a social context with professionals, with social systems, with healthcare systems. And the second context, you could call the intervention context. We must understand that as well. And the third one, that is, um, it's the implementation context because the intervention can only work uh, in relation to implementation factors. And this, the, the last one is mostly interested for people who want to disseminate interventions to other settings, but the first two are relevant to all of us because in the end, we need to understand why a particular intervention, how it works, uh, along which mechanisms. Um, and so what I'm in relation to your question, I think we need to evaluate interventions more than we do now and carefully describe all these context factors that might include a particular pandemic or another traumatic uh, event scene, but only by describing it carefully and, but, and by repeating evaluations, at a certain moment we have enough information to draw more firm conclusions about which intervention works in which context. So mm. sorry that it's a bit a long answer, but it's, it's not an easy question, sorry. Thank you, thank you for the answer. Yeah, understood everything. Lisa, you uh, raised your hand. Oh, but you need to unmute, you need to unmute first. Sorry, about, sorry. <laughs> um, I was just thinking, in fact, both as response to Joseph's questions on the climate crisis and also as a follow up of what uh, Michelle just uh, said, I think uh, it's, one thing is the evaluation, but also the monitoring of each intervention. Now there are different interventions and we have quite little information on what actually works the best. But if we plan in advance to have good, like some, some aspects of monitoring that could both be used to like um, continuously evaluate the approach that, that is chosen after a specific event, and then also um, create a framework around that so that you can create a, a research based on that to, to have more generalizable knowledge because we will face more crisis in the future. So that uh, I think it's important that we together create a framework for how to obtain better knowledge on what actually works. So I think that's once again, it's wonderful that you're um, uh, making the efforts or creating such a network, because I think that can be crucial in order to create better um, psychosocial care responses to the future um, uh, crisis that we will face. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I think, I think the point is that, that you know, uh, for us, uh, because there is so much interest in this, and but usually the focus is about the physical consequence, but not so much about the mental. And I think we should raise the flag and to make sure that people understand that we need to prepare for this from the mental point of view. From, from, uh, and, and I think the point that Ul Ul Ulrike made, uh, we need to take different scenario, including the scenario that the smartphone that we so used to are not functional. Yes. So we should have an alternative plan for this. And I think, I think now, because there are a lot of interest in this field, I think the focus should be about how we can implement what we have learned to the future event. So thank you. I'd like to just uh, close up, but not yet. I'll, I'd like to give uh, Lisa the last word and Michelle the last word, maybe for 30 seconds, something you'd like to wrap up or say before we do the closing of this uh, session. Lisa, we, you want to go first and then Michelle second, but please, brief, brief statement. Uh, well, um, actually, I think just to, to almost repeat what, what I what I said that I think it's really the fact if to, to create, uh, to collaborate in order to create a framework so that we across countries can generate better knowledge. Um, I think that's a really important step forward. Um, so, so, so and, and also to think about the guidelines that we have today, to what extent are they applicable? And how can we get more knowledge about what's actually being done? And then again, create new guidelines that will be even more applicable. Yeah. So, so um, I think that's perhaps one of the um, core um, interests for my part uh, forward. Thank you. And thank you once again. Thank you once. There was not for no reason that you cited Ultra Ursula von der Leyen from the European Union in your first opening statement slide, right? <laughs> Yeah, that, that was, uh, I think that's, uh, uh, there is an interest also from the stakeholders. So I think that's an op opportunity for us. So, so thank you for, for pointing that out. Michelle, you want to go last with your final wrap up, maybe briefly, if you can uh, keep it briefly. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, well, you know, uh, if you can keep it briefly, nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course. I, I, I really uh, appreciate this podium, and I think um, the fact that we have an exchange like this is indispensable to be able to formulate good guidance. And um, well, I learned a lot today. I'm really happy to see that um, the, the, the matrix turned into an app that we can all test. So I, I would like to ask everyone to indeed provide their yeah. feedback so that we can make it better together. And the last <clears> thing I would like to say um, apart from my appreciation to the hosts of today, of, of course. So thank you very much, Eric, Irina, and Joseph. Um, the, these guidelines we make, they are in fact evolving creatures and they are never ready because the societies in which we live, they are constantly adapting. They are constantly changing. So the documents have to change as well because health right. systems change, societies change, culture changes, technology changes. So it's an ongoing process. Yeah, and uh, well, let's enjoy this travel together. <laughs>